It was the turn of the last century in rural Scotland where David Galbraith farmed a small but successful allotment which had been passed down over generations. The farm yielded abundant crops of oats, corn and potatoes under his skillful management, the superior produce commanding high prices in the market. The eldest of six orphans, Galbraith had assumed a fatherly role towards his younger siblings and not married until the last of them was off his hands. His youngest brother Colin had finally left to work on a sheep run in Australia with money lent to him by David, who was now able to marry his beau, a Miss Alison McGilvray. She was a well-educated local lady who came well dowried and was to prove an asset in his farm management. Despite the size of their sprawling, centuries-old stone farmhouse, the couple were to produce only one child, a boy who was named Alexander, conveniently after both of his grandfathers. The tiny baby seemed weak and failed to thrive, catching every ailment around and causing his parents constant worry. Fortunately, he survived the perils of his sickly infancy and by six years of age had grown into a delicate but bright child. The family doctor who had treated him over those years forbade his parents to arrange a formal education for him until he was eight or nine. Nevertheless, the clever child had a wonderful memory and stored a host of stories, legends and ballads which his mother and nurse Effie had told or sung to him. However, the doctor had also strongly advised them that above all else, the young Sandy, as he was now called, was never to be frightened with tales of ghosts or other supernatural phenomena. The women strictly adhered to this rule and were therefore shocked to one day be accused by his father of poisoning his mind with stories of witches, warlocks, ghosts and other ideas which had rendered him an uncanny ban. A strange occurrence had occurred which had greatly distressed Sandy's parents. One very cold afternoon in late October, he had accompanied Effie when his mother had asked her to deliver some soup and pudding to an elderly neighbour called Elspeth. On reaching the old lady's cottage, Sandy was reluctant to place the food basket on the table and simply stood before Elspeth, pale and staring. He then asked her why she had coins covering her eyes and a white cloth wrapped around her head. Both women were shocked as Elspeth accused Sandy of having second sight and seeing her destined for the grave, wanting him gone. As Effie took the boy home, he continued to insist that he had seen coins over the old lady's eyes and a white cloth around her head. Effie was sure that he did not know the meaning of his words, as he had never seen death or how a corpse was prepared, nor was he able to have read about it in books. She decided not to tell his parents of the strange incident, but informed her fellow servants and three days later decided to check on Elspeth. Chillingly, the old lady was laid out, deceased on her bed, with coins over her eyes and a white shroud around her head, as Sandy had described. The two women sitting with her claimed that Elspeth had suffered no illness, but taken to her bed the night of Effie and Sandy's visit. From that day, David Galbraith took on the daily care of his son, convinced that Sandy had overheard superstitious chatter from within the household, although both his wife and Effie assured him otherwise. David's grandmother had had the second sight and virtually terrorised the family with her premonitions of death and calamity, which were always unfailingly true. Deep down he was appalled that her ghostly gift may have descended to her grandson. Neighbours would shun them and sure enough the local minister, when told, was not happy about having Sandy in his church. In the following spring, Galbraith's brother Colin returned 
after an absence of 10 years to spend some time with his relatives in Scotland. His business in Australia was now prospering and he was delighted to meet his nephew. Until one day after their game of golf, Sandy suddenly claimed to have seen Colin's house in Australia. He described the house and a scene where there was a fire in the grass and two men were trying to save Colin's mare and foal. One had a black beard and was shouting at a man named O'Grady. Colin was shocked that these were his two employees, but became even more so when a few days later he received a telegram informing him of heavy losses he had sustained from a serious bushfire. Both he and David became convinced that Sandy was indeed an uncanny bairn. Colin immediately set for home, his parting words to the family, the rueful comment that if any mischance should befall him, Sandy would be able to let them know. Just prior to the long, tough work of the oat cutting season, Galbraith decided to take Sandy out for a day's hunting, rowing to nearby Bass Rock. On their way back, after a long day, he noticed Sandy staring into the water. When asked what he was gaping at, Sandy gave an ominous reply. He could see his uncle Colin in the water, his face upturned, his eyes wide open but unseeing. Furious, Galbraith rowed even more vigorously, shouting at Sandy to move further into the boat so that he could not see anything. But Sandy insisted that he saw Uncle Colin, surrounded by seaweed and staring above and that his father was now striking the oar on Colin's white face. With this last vision, a heavy gloom settled on the Galbraith family, and even Sandy became frightened as they awaited terrible news. They told no one outside the family, filled with concern about the boy's future. Nearly a month later, David read of the safe arrival of his brother's ship, with the exception of one casualty. A passenger named Colin Galbraith had mysteriously fallen overboard in calm weather and had drowned. David and Alison carefully compared the dates and found that Colin had drowned three days after Sandy's vision of the body in the sea. From this time onwards, David Galbraith became a changed man nervous, superstitious, fearful, and an increasingly heavy drinker. Some two years passed by in which Sandy had no visions and seemed to be growing healthier and stronger, as well as an excellent gardener. One afternoon, Alison watched him with pride through the window as he tended his plot, starting to put together a bouquet that she knew was for her, when suddenly he seemed to become transfixed. Dropping the flowers, his face became pale and pinched, and he shuddered as though in a cold wind. Assuring herself that her husband was asleep in his chair, Alison rushed outside and begged Sandy that, if he was seeing again, not to tell his father. The boy sighed and staggered as if dizzy, and Alison took him away from the window in case her husband awoke. Sandy had seen his father lying at the foot of a hill by the Campbell's gates with his eyes closed. The following Friday was the corn market in town and David Galbraith prepared to set out, now sober and in shrewd business mode. As he mounted his horse, Alison wished him luck with also a strong wish that he should avoid the steep hill near the Campbell's gates. This he refused as it made his journey a mile longer, insisting that his horse Kelpie would be sober and was strong and reliable. Filled with apprehension, Alison lingered outside for hours in the midsummer gloaming, then returned to the house as the clock struck midnight. David was really later than that. Finally, she was relieved to hear Kelpie's familiar steps as she decided to wait in her room for her husband's return. 
The horse had stopped outside the gate and David had had time to dismount, but the gate had not opened. Now there was just the sound of Kelpie impatiently striking the ground with one of his forefeet. Alison finally slipped downstairs, outside and across the garden to the gate, a deadly fear pressing on her spirit. As she flung the gate open and saw Kelpie standing there riderless, she felt no surprise, only an assurance that her son's vision was about to come true. After stabling Kelpie, she simply ran, making her way to the steep hill by the Campbell's gates, as Sandy had predicted. She ran in a frenzy as her limbs almost gave way beneath her, finally rounding the turn that would bring her to the foot of the hill, where waited what she most dreaded. The calm silence of the summer night was broken by her wailing cry as Alison Galbraith fell faint on the lifeless body of her husband. She later found out that her husband had been sober that night. The legend goes that her husband had been overtaken with his old horror, thinking that he heard a horseman following hard on him. David had urged his horse to gallop down the hill, at the foot of which Kelpie had slipped on a rolling stone and thrown his rider heavily to the ground, never to speak or move again. Alison Galbraith did not long survive her husband and her passing took place without any prophetic intimations from Sandy. His weird gift departed him and he never had another vision or predictive insight after his father's demise. The sickly child grew up to be a robust farmer with his own family who would never allow any to speak of his childhood second sight. At the end of this story, the author, Louisa Baldwin, notes that it is based on an account which may well be true.